Hey everyone, welcome to this week's O Ship. This week we're going to explore the idea of what it is to build a venture studio or a startup studio. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's a company that works to build several different companies with some hopefully really inspiring business building entrepreneurs rapidly and simultaneously while also investing some capital along the way. And today we've got one of the pioneers of the space joining us to share some lessons that he's learned from building one of the earliest venture studios. We're going to dig into what he's learned about entrepreneurship, investing, collaboration, invention, leading, and even maybe a little bit of losing. After all, it is O'Ship. So if you're not familiar with John Borthwick, he's the co-founder of Betaworks. He had a varied career mixing consulting work, entrepreneurial ventures, and corporate work at large internet companies. Frankly, he's done too many interesting things to list, but here are some highlights. He started his first venture studio, WP Studio, in 1994, which was later acquired. He was the head of AOL's product development studio. He was Time Warner's SVP of alliances and technology strategy. And then he jumped into the startup game as the CEO of Photolog, one of the first social photo sharing sites, which was also later acquired. But he's probably best known for founding Betaworks, a very pivotal and influential startup studio. If you may not have heard of them, you've definitely heard of some of their notable creations over the years, which include things like Bitly, Giphy, which I'm still paying as a subscriber, Dots, that game, Poncho, Chartbeat, Tumblr, Kickstarter, Medium, TweetDeck, and GroupMe. And then if you start looking even more recently, you're starting to look at you know, AI companies like Hugging Face and Stability AI. And I think Betaworks has got themselves into about 10 plus AI driven companies at this point. So with that, let's welcome John to this week's show. Here we go with OSHA. Hey, John, welcome to Ship. Glad you're hey, here. Hey, Freddie. Nice to see you. Nice to uh, be here. In events of the show, I've just been digging in more and more to your background and your history. And you've done a lot of really cool stuff. And I don't get any sense you're done anytime soon. But it's a real honor to pick your brain today on Ship. One of the things I'd like to start with is you know, for some people who watch our ship are very familiar with the Venture Studio. I'd love to just kind of explore what you think it means to be a successful Venture Studio or uh, to build a successful venture studio in 2023, because I think evolution of this has changed quite a lot over the years. Yeah. Yeah. So I think venture studios have, you know, since we started Bayworks, I have taken on a variety of different forms. So I think it's become sort of a fairly big tent with quite a few different approaches, but I think at a high level, like you said, what characterizes about it, it is a company that makes several companies. As a venture studio, you are either incubating or accelerating a set of companies inside of the entity. And the objective is to, at least in the case of Betaworks, was always to sort of define an area that we had a particular interest in. So in the early days, we did a lot in as social, we defined the way that the internet was working. And so there was a sort of there was a thematic overlay to Betaworks from the outset. Uh, that, that is something that quite a few venture studios pursue. So I've seen venture studios in the health tech area. I've seen people in climate tech use venture studios. I've seen people in security use venture studios. Recently, I was talking to somebody who was looking at building new venture studios, who was focused on specifically on AI. And so I, I think that having a thematic overlay is, is one of a couple of approaches, but that's the approach that we've taken. Is the kind of you know, method for creation changed over the years, or does it feel like you're still sticking to the kind of core principles for ideating new companies that you were doing when you first started? It's definitely changed. I think on one hand, you've become better at it over time and we sort of understand I think we're in the better sense of what works and what doesn't. So I think there's some learning there. I also think the market has just evolved tremendously. We're based in New York City and you know, we started Bay Works up in 2008 in New York. And at that point we were obsessively interested in this, in consumer tech and in specifically how social was redefining the way people would try things, share things, create things online. 
And, and at that point, there were very few startups in the New York tech space period. And there were very few startups in, in that area. Today, you know, you could take any particular area of tech and here in New York, there's, you know, probably a startup within a 10 box, if not maybe a mile or two that's doing work in that space. And so just the sheer number of, of startup activity has changed dramatically. And I think that also changes the usefulness of Venture Studio and the approach that you should take with Venture Studio. So we sort of modified our approach to the studio yeah. over time, but we've also learned, I think, how to do it better. Yeah. What is the impact when you've got so many people, you know, in a community nearby? Are they competition? Is it cooperation? Is it inspiration? Is it all of those things? I'd love to get a sense of that from your perspective. Since we have this thematic, we start with a theme or a thesis, and we basically say, we believe. So today we have, like you said at the outset, we're doing a lot of work in the applied AI space. And we believe that sort of specifically that AI and machine learning as it applies to creative tools and to tools that augment human capabilities that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there and new creation there. So we sort of define a thesis and then around that we help seed and we also participate in essentially an ecosystem of startups in that space. And some of those startups will be ones which we have either invested in, accelerated in or incubated. So any of those approaches. And then, you know, in the early stages of usually a lot of cooperation. When startups are really small, the membranes are really permeable. There's a lot of cooperation between startups. And then as they grow up, they bring a lot of capabilities internal to the organization. They establish sort of what they're doing and how they get product market fit and how the business starts to develop. And then they sort of, you know, start to figure out the moats around them and they become more competitive mm -hmm. by nature. But they usually start pretty collaboratively. Obviously, I'm passionate around the concept of a collective thinking and, you know, this kind of sense that you can be competitive, but also cooperative. I'd be intrigued to see how much of this kind of sense of collaboration that you think is out there, which I also think exists, how much of that is like due to like this kind of culture that I think has emerged, especially over the last 10 years of this kind of fraternal order of like entrepreneurs the sense that, you know, we all need to be out there trying to help each other. Do you think it's part of the DNA of the new culture or is it something else? I mean, I think that there's definitely a cultural shift, right? And, you know, I look at my kids and my kids' friends, you know, when I grew up, people wanted to be rock stars. Now they want to be entrepreneurs, right? So I think entrepreneurship has taken on just a very different position and role in society. I think that a lot of what we've discovered works within a venture studio is to have a fairly flexible and loose environment for experimentation around startups. And so I think that there's a lot of entrepreneurship is about, and a lot of books, podcasts about entrepreneurship is, you know, very much about directive thinking or objective-based thinking, you know, setting goals, meeting goals and driving towards goals. I think the actual process of company creation is much more about sort of discovering through experimentation and some direction, but also a lot of flexibility around adjacency and the sort of the possibilities of the adjacent ideas and adjacent hops in the sort of ideation process. So I think that culturally entrepreneurship is like such an important part of our culture today, and it's very present in these ecosystems. And yet some of these ecosystems are, I think, very sort of competitively driven around objectives. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of what Adventure Studios sort of helps establish within the context of a sort of an, a city or a, a center of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is the ability to do experimentation, mm -hmm. because I think you really need that. And, you know, if you ask me on the short list of things, which we've learned in Adventure Studio is oh. that if you become excessively linear in your, you know, directed in your thinking, I think you're unlikely to be successful or find amazing ideas in company. That's interesting. And so when you say being excessively linear, is this like a willingness to be able to evolve from the original idea? 
like a certain mental flexibility. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you go through and take, for example, with Bitly, right? Bitly started as a tool that we created for another startup. And so it becomes a, a go-to link shortening service for a lot of people. And yet we actually started out because we needed it for something else. And we thought it was just an API that we would set up as basically a service that this other thing we were building would use. And then Bitly started growing and we just redeployed the team onto Bitly. You know, the team who started Giphy started in a different place. And then one weekend they sort of hacked together Giphy and, you know, on Sunday, Monday morning, I remember there was this thing called Giphy was stood up with, as a GIF search engine and it was already exploding. And so being able to have that kind of flexibility within the team with flexibility from a people capital perspective, I think is really important. You know, there's a great book, which is this guy who I had the pleasure of talking to a few months ago, but wrote a book called Why Greatness Can't Be Planned. And I think it's by Kenneth Stanley. I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah. So K Kenneth Stanley, right? Why Greatness Can't Be Planned. And he's actually, he's an engineer. So he breaks this down as very much like an engineering problem. It's being able to be hypothesis driven. So you're basically saying, hey, I got a theory about the world. I'm going to basically stand up a beta test that beta and see if it works. Hence the name. Rinse and repeat, keep testing. But they're going to be very open to the possibility that this other thing over here, and then sort of like random fork over here, maybe where the idea needs to go and maybe where the big idea is. And the term pivoting is often just this, right? It's kind of like shorthand to that. And I think that the fact that pivoting has become a positive thing. Mm -hmm. There's no shame in pivoting, I think is a very good sign for entrepreneurship because you look at the Huggy Face team, you know, they are yeah, now this huge marketplace for large language models and a big player in the AI space. They actually started off by creating a chat box for kids and for middle schoolers. They started it in a very, very different space and part of their brilliance was understanding that what they had actually built was an underlying language model that then could be refactored, reused by other people. They got very engaged in the open source community and they started building this marketplace of models and then they pivoted the whole company. But the reason why it's called Hugging Face, it's named after an emoji. The reason why it's called that is because it was meant to be, as the founder said to me when I first met him, it was, it was meant to be cute. It was meant to be like a pet. I love that. I would have never known that context, the history of it. Yeah. Two things I want to touch on and, and then dig in a bit more in, in your creative process. One is I love this idea that you suggest is like, Hey, look, if you're an entrepreneur, I think there was a time when it was like, they, we kind of put these entrepreneurs, these visionary entrepreneurs up on a pedestal who had these resolute visions and would accomplish them at all costs. And I think, you know, you're saying, look, I think being an entrepreneur is a journey. You want to start kind of pull in all the data you can do all these explorations, these tests, and let the opportunity lead you, you know, versus this kind of greatness can't be planned moment that I think we, maybe we used to honor. I think that's really interesting. And then the second thing that you said earlier, I'd love to just kind of get back to you for a minute. You said, you know, when you were younger, people wanted to be rock stars and now they want to be entrepreneurs. And I would double down on that by even saying that now we're at a place where there's, we've got rock stars who want to be entrepreneurs. So it's like, you could be yeah, a rock star. Man. And all of a sudden you're like, do you see all these guys who are out there back in VCs, investing, yeah. starting their own yeah. companies? Yeah. So I think that's kind of hilarious. People are like, yeah, I kind of did the rock star thing, but um, I'm going to go be a SaaS entrepreneur now. <laughs> like, so, like, I'm going to go be yeah. a mobile app. Yeah. Like, get in there. To say, I was a nerd as a kid. And the, you know, the reason why I'm here, Freddie, was because when you emailed me, I was like, Freddie Laker. And, you know, your dad was like an inspiration to me when I was a kid. Wow. And Thanks. thank you for that. But I think that that full cycle of rock stars down when you become on yeah. is really funny. I, for the record, I can tell you, you're an inspiration for this kind of things I want to do these days. So you come full cycle, my friend. That's great. <laughs> or full circle. Maybe we should both be. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the tendency in our culture to sort of like find one size fits all solutions. I believe that there are extraordinary people who have like that light bulb moment and end up building 
extraordinary things and uh, extraordinary companies. And it's that sort of classical entrepreneurship, you know, sort of like Tesla. I, I'm talking about Nikola Tesla, but you could talk about Elon Musk yeah. too, about that sort of like that classic light bulb moment, right? There is that. I think that that has become the stereotype of the only entrepreneur path. And I think that there is also that if you really step back and looked at the entire sort of market of entrepreneurship, I think that there is at least as large, maybe larger number of cases that entrepreneurship happens in more of a social context. And by that, I mean that there is a small group of people that start building towards something. You know, there's this very curious sort of phenomenon that you see in entrepreneurship where the same things seem to get built at, you know, similar times in different places. So it seems to be almost like something in the water, suddenly getting people interested in this particular idea. And you get people who like start building towards it and then they build little ecosystems and they sort of like start to figure out what is the sort of new modality of innovation that is going to like, you know, change the world and that it is more social. And yet when those people grow up, when those companies grow up, they more often than not then get chucked into that stereotype, which I think is a bit unfortunate because it's just screwed up because it gives people a view that there's only one way to do entrepreneurship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. And I think that's a great segue to, you know, one of the things I feel like we've been chatting about is the classic perception of how entrepreneurs create ideas. What I'd love to do is talk about how within a venture studio, you've talked about the collaborative nature. I've heard stories of how, you know, you guys, I don't know if any of this is true, by the way, but I've heard stories of the kind of brown bag lunch type things that made it work. So a bunch of very clever people would sit around and tear through ideas be really intrigued to hear about if you're open to sharing it, your guys kind of creative process. How do you birth ideas? Because it doesn't sound like it's, you know, Nicholas Tesla having a light bulb moment, so to speak. It feels like it's something different. It's different from what we just chatted about, or it could be the same. I'd love to find out what your take is. Yeah. So, I mean, it's more awesome than that. It's a truly social process, right? And we have over the years had a series of things that we've done at Betaworks to sort of increase the pace of sharing and experimentation in a particular area. So it starts off with a thesis, right? We start off with a particular area of the world that we're interested in, and then we have a particular theory about it, right? The first thing that we do is we will look for startups in that space, right? And so there are often startups that are actually building in that space already. If there are not startups in that space that, who are building them, we have historically, we have either started accelerator programs, which Today, we're doing more and more through accelerator programs, or we've actually started a company. And in both cases, it's a combination of experimentation, sort of like having a hypothesis and having a point of view about a particular application of a technology and then getting it into market very quickly and testing it, and then coming back and saying, okay. Given my hypothesis, what did I find out to be true? What did I not find out to be true? You know, what resonates with users, what doesn't resonate with users. And so the beta testing or what I call beta working process is really about that sort of very tight feedback so that you can generate between a, often a single developer, a hypothesis and a set of users. And so it's like being able to just very quickly put something into market but being very clear about what the objectives are, what you're actually testing against, right? You know, you can become as an entrepreneur, you usually do become, and this is a good thing, usually very sort of like passionately and emotionally engaged in a particular hypothesis. So this is going to work because this for the following reason, that passion and that emotion needs to be contained with a analytical sort of view of, okay. How much of that actually turned out to be true? Uh, because you're not always right. Yeah. How much support does an organization like Betaworks or a traditional venture studio normally give people bringing an idea to life? Do you guys keep like devs and stuff on your roster? Like when you talk about building a company, like how does deep does that normally go? Yeah. So historically back in the early days of Betaworks, we sort of went through 
all of these sort of the core functions of a company and sort of try to have people on staff within those core functions. So to see what could be effectively shared across startups. So everything from data science to backend engineering, to design, to brands, to, you know, recruiting. And depending on the time, like depending on sort of what the market stage of development, the market was in, we found different areas to be more effective. We also found certain capabilities, like at one point we tried to centralize some sales function for some companies that we had built. You'd have that work out. It didn't work. Right. And so those guys are hard, man. I think. Yeah. And they need to be, and they need to be sort of completely committed, completely sort of, you know, focused on one particular thing. If they get to choose, then they pick and choose and they'll be incentivized to pick and choose. And so that didn't work, but we went through every sort of function, tried it. Today we have, we've moved into much more of an acceleration mode at Betaworks where we're doing predominantly early stage works for acceleration and then investing. And so we've sort of evolved the model that's because the market has evolved and because also the areas that we're focused on, we think that those are the tools that both best fit those particular areas that we're interested in. You mentioned earlier how some of your earlier thesis was around social companies, and now you guys are shifting more into the AI space. So what are the things that kind of most excite you now? What's creating all the buzz, both the beta works and in the mind of John Borthwick? Let me go back to the previous question, because I think a critical characteristic or a critical thing within a venture studio is you have to figure out why it makes more sense for the entrepreneurs to be inside of a venture studio versus out in the open market on their own. And so you have to be able to keep them some kind of unfair advantage. We talked about capabilities, right? You know, just like you know, if you have a core team of data scientists and your data, that could be any capability that could be shared amongst a set of startups that say in the AI space and gives them an unfair advantage in space. If you are in the sort of med tech space, you could have IP and specific patents that could be shared. If you are in the climate space, you may have specific hardware that you're sharing amongst the startups. You have to think about it, a venture studio as a business and the business, it is a thing that makes things, right? You're going to make things in that and you have to have an unfair advantage with the marketplace on what things you are making. Well, this is that collective so, mindset. So uh, there's this collective yeah. advantage, I think, in the knowledge sharing, but there's also this, you know, collectives at their core, ultimately about sharing. So you've, you know, shared resources, shared infrastructure, shared mindset, shared talent. The only thing that probably doesn't exist in that is shared decision-making, but it sounds like there's certainly shared ideation in, in some of this. Uh, yeah, that's all right. I can't help but yeah. rant on this when it's a subject I'm super passionate about. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it, it's an interesting subject. So to go to your previous question, we're doing a lot of work in the applied AI space. We're doing still some work also in crypto media and then some work in the metaverse space. But I think that specifically AI and, you know, sort of the evolution of machine learning and where we are today, we've seen some stunning developments over the last five years and specifically in the last year, 18 months where you know, both language models, visual models across different modalities, these AI models have become incredibly good at very specific tasks and sometimes good at some general tasks. And that's where we're spending a lot of time. I believe that the AI machine learning revolution transition to what we're going through right now will be as big as the internet itself, if not bigger. And so I think that this is a huge wave of entrepreneurship that we are just at the beginning of. And so this is. So if you think about the really big ones of the last couple of decades, obviously the internet completely world changing, but you could argue smartphones are in there. Is AI and social obviously was a subset of the internet, but obviously massive implications. So AI and all this surrounding technologies around it, even bigger than the implications of smartphones. I think way bigger because you think about every single thing. So the first thing I would say is that 
when we talk about AI, we're talking about it in these very abstract terms. And, you know, most people have come across AI sort of in the context of Hollywood and sort of, you know, sci-fi and most dystopian views of the world. The biggest AI systems that we interact with daily are things like TikTok and Google. You know, I would say TikTok's probably sort of the dominant AI that, you know, is used the most, particularly by kids. But I think search has a component of AI that is critical to being able to use search effectively. We are now going through this transition where we're starting to experiment with conversational interfaces, which is a different modality or way of interacting with data. But you think generally pretty across every single domain, right? From climate to obviously medicine to education. Last year was remarkable for a few things. One is that you had these visual models like Dali that came out that, you know, did a incredibly good job of being able to take a text-based description and being able to generate an image or a, a set of images that could then be strung together into a short animation. You could make things, just make things, right? It was just like stunning work to do. And then you had, you know, midway through the year, you had the open source community basically took the DALI model, which cost, you know, hundreds of millions to train and they replicated it for like a fraction of the cost. And they also compressed it down to a fraction of the size. So you saw the sort of commoditization of these models. So you started to see with visual models and you started to see language models. But at this point, right, you have chat GPT was released. I think it was November 30th, call it December 1st. And you know, I was in a cab earlier this week and there was New York Public Radio was talking on the news show about the implications of chat GPT to education. You know, I have never seen a technology that has so swiftly moved into mainstream consciousness. And it's hard so, to wrap your head around you know, the fact that it was only three months ago. Yeah. 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 And, you know, on one hand, you're sitting in the cab and like, oh, they're talking about chat GPT on public radio. And on the other hand, you're like, what the fuck? You know, you're just like, that's unbelievable. And I think that's because I think that we've become much more technically literate as a society, which is a really good thing. I think that there's a general understanding and a general belief of data over the last 20 years, we've built all these amazing tools that many of them are independent by data. And that data is now going to be used by these models to essentially create the things that I can then interact with and machines can interact with. And that was both incredibly exciting, incredibly powerful, is going to transform the world, also has some kind of scary connotations, which we need to talk about as a society. So I think people think about them as it relates to education, healthcare, you know? Yeah, it's one of the things with the amount of data we are, to your point, I do feel like we've been building these applications for decades. And people have talked about this wealth of data that we've been accumulating. And then I think one of the bigger challenges I've seen people chat about in, you know, in the same 20, last, let's call it last 20 years, certainly last 10 was like, oh, there's all this stuff we can do with it. And everyone's getting all excited about it. But then it didn't feel like people were actually doing that much stuff with it. And I feel like on some level it's kind of overwhelming. But then when you start training these AIs to deal with these large data sets and not just to extract value out of the prior data, but then to understand how to work with the future data so that it can do things in real time and act so intelligently. That's when you kind of realize like, would all of this been possible today? Had we not kind of accumulated that so much rich data in the last periods of time. And that makes you realize it's it's convergence, you know, you couldn't. Yeah. 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 And also some sort of accidental sort of like, I would argue that the Integration of image tags across the internet, where most people added tags to their images in order to drive SEO, Mm -hmm. that that kind of like set the stage for for a lot of these visual models to be able to start to be trained and to be able to look at picture and say, Mm -hmm. oh, that picture of a boat sailing on the sea will stay with the same. And there's a boat in this picture, there's a sun in picture, there's a sea in the picture, there's a mountain behind. And you know, what are the objects, right? Because they're being tagged. And so I think that we help set the stage and search definitely sort of functionally helps set the stage. I think also we've been 
wanting to communicate with these, I was going to say the network, that sounds kind of creepy, but you know, we have a very, very sort of like narrow straw that we're using this thing, right? Or this thing in order to communicate, right? And to type into the network, right? And being able to speak and being able to use language as a modality with these models is truly transformative because I think that that is, that's something we've been trying to do for, you know, 50 plus years. Just like the parents aren't really supposed to have favorite kids. I know investors aren't really supposed to have favorite investments, but obviously we don't have enough time to kind of look across everything you're involved in right now. Is there one specific example from your portfolio that you find exciting and interesting, you'd be interested in sharing with our audience of how this technology is being applied today? You know, I think that we talked about hanging face that I think are doing remarkable things. I think that stability is a really good example, right? I went through it sort of fast, but you know, they managed to take these closed models and replicate them for a fraction of the price. You can go into their website and you can go to Dream Studio and, you know, they have this amazing product where you can create visual images and animations using text-based prompts and they're a London-based company, they're a remarkable company. They're also a totally fascinating company because they've worked with the open source community. And so they are, you know, to some extent, a collective, right? I first met them and the founder during COVID and he was using AI tools to do a lot of research with the World Health Organization during COVID. But then as he started working on stability. He started working with the open source community and it essentially acted as this sort of like central hub for an ecosystem of developers, engineers in the open source community that wanted to replicate these closed models. And that's what they ended up standing up and creating a open source version of the closed model, which was this Dali thing and did that remarkably fast and remarkably cheaply and also managed to compress it down so that you could run on a MacBook. So they did some incredible things, but the approach to development was a lot of parallels with some of the works in web three and web downs, but it was very much about a collective coming together and a group of people actually creating this. So. Super interesting. On a side note, one of the recurring themes that pops up on O'Ship is my love of games. I've been a lifelong video gamer and always building these kind of very over the top liquid cooled gaming rigs. And I never dreamt that my new machine that I'm working on now, that I'm probably going to spend more time goofing around running AI image generation on it. Cause now you can run them locally and then I'm probably going to be screwed around playing games. I think that's kind of. So, you know, it wouldn't be our ship if I didn't ask for an our ship question. So for those of you who may be joining our ship for the first time, one of the things, inspirations for the show and why we put it together is I love being able to talk to guys and pe people like John that have had really incredible, inspiring stories and had a lot of success in their careers, but also kind of saying, look, tell us a moment where maybe it didn't go as planned, where what you, the goal you set out to do maybe didn't achieve or something crazy happened along the way that three or kind of knocked you on your ass a little bit, if you don't mind me saying, and I'm really intrigued by how people deal with those situations. Sometimes that might be some kind of inspiring story that is how they evolved as a leader and how it changed them as a person. Sometimes it's none of those things. It's just something funny that didn't feel very funny at the time, but maybe feels funny, you know, 10 years later. Anything that is though, I love this idea of kind of understanding the before and after. And I also feel like it helps other entrepreneurs or investors out there to know that, you know, it's not always a straight line for even some of the most successful people. So with that, I'd love to hear an O ship story, John, if you grace us. Sure. I often think that every day you wake up and you start work on your startup and you start thinking about the sort of where you stand and that you think that on the spectrum of like a zero to 10, that you're either 10 or you're zero. And I think that, you know, in most cases, most days, most people are at like four, five or six, but it feels like a 10 or a zero. So like when things are going well, you feel like the wind is behind you and there's absolutely no way that you can stop. And then when things are not going well, you think like, this is like, this is, oh shit, this is like a disaster. I'm down at zero. 
I think the reality is that in most cases, you are sort of at a four or five or six, you're like closer to the middle or the median of that. You tend to magnify that because you're so emotionally engaged in the product, mm. right? You're so interested in bringing this thing into the world and you're so convinced that this thing is going to be world changing that any particular setback feels really shitty or like any particular advance strike feels totally amazing. And so you over magnify that. So why is this helpful? It's helpful because when you wake up and things feel kind of shitty and you're sort of down at the end of the spectrum, I think a lot of that is just about perspective and is about the stories which you tell yourself and that you should remind yourself that when you felt last week, because you shipped a particular product, you get a particular number of users engaged, you made a sale, you did something that you saw last week that you were like on top of the earth and now you feel like you're not. You got to like recapture some of that feeling and know that it is all a journey, right? You are like growing and you're building these products, you're growing as a person and you're learning as a person. And as we go through these things, I think hopefully become a bit wiser in the process. It's going to be a really intense journey. A lot of people don't realize this, but I'm 22 years old and this is what startup life has done to me. So, you know. That uh, can be quite intense, obviously kidding, but it's a bit like, you know, to your point though, I think it can be really exhausting physically and mentally. And I do think there's this almost extreme nature, I think about a lot of entrepreneurs. I don't want to stereotype everyone, but this kind of intensity of willing to jump into it so hard. And I think sometimes that gets reflected back into this kind of self-evaluation you right. give yourself. And I think so. I think that's well, well said. Yeah, I think it's, that, it, that's, that's good advice. It's it, entrepreneurship can be so lonely. And I think that making it social and making it, you know, finding groups of people that you can share it with and where you can have real discussions with other entrepreneurs, because I think that so much of the entrepreneurial process is performance. You're pitching, you're basically telling stories about things, which you want to be, you want to build, or you want to be true and being able to have spaces and small groups of people that you could actually sort of come back to and say, you know, things are going really well, or things are not going so great, or I want to, you know, I want to kill my co-founder, you know, uh, it's just like, you know, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need to have the space to be able to do that. Right. So I've got one final question for you and kind of taking, not that I think this is the kind of answer you're going to give anyway, but taking out the financial side of it, exits and things like that, what do you consider the greatest success to your career? Put you on the spot big time. Sorry, John. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think that the, I think that I have, you know, through, so what has been a very winding path, but when I tell the story, it sounds like it's a straight line. I found, you know, what I'm really good at and what I love doing. And that to me is just like, you know, every day I get the privilege to work with amazing people and to do what I love doing. That's precious. I'm lucky. And I appreciate that. You're here. So, yeah. You know, it's funny. So kindred spirit. That's almost exactly the same answer I would have given. That, I, for me, I think that's what real success looks like. So hats off to you, mate. I'm glad you feel that way. Well-deserved. So I really enjoyed today's chat. Uh, obviously, other people I, that have tuned in today will have enjoyed it as well. If they want to learn more about you or follow you any place, what's the best places they should be thinking about to reach out to you or learn more about you? Yeah, so Twitter is a good place to follow us. I met both Rick and then those Spadeworks. So those are good places to follow us. A strange place. I'm not quite as active there as I used to be, but I'm still there. And then obviously on our website and twice a year, we run these accelerator programs. And so if you're out there and you're building something and one of our accelerator programs resonates with us, you know, drop us a note. And if you're in New York city and you're a startup, you know, you can come by and see us we are down in the backing area. That is, those are easy ways to find us. Great. Very generous of you. So those of you tuning in, thank you again for watching today's ship. whether you're watching any of the video streams across YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, or tuning in on audio across Google podcasts, Apple podcasts, you know, Stitcher, any of the other platforms we stream on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching our ship. Your support means a lot to us. The best thing you can do is subscribe to support us. You can do that by clicking on the QR code up above or going to shipshare.com and you'll see links to all of the different places we stream and you can pick whatever, you know, strikes your fancy. 
And you know, please continue to support the show by leaving comments on our videos or giving us a like or sharing them on your feeds. It really, really means a lot to us. John, thank you again for sharing up today. It was great to chat with you. I look forward to getting to know you better. And uh, it was wonderful that you were able to make some time for this in our audience. So thank you again. A pleasure. Thank you. Great. Everyone, we'll see you next week on Earthship. Thank you.